All right, live. Hello, everybody. It's been a while. I've been pretty busy with life and things, but I have been taking my time to do my reading, and I want to do a review of a book that I've mentioned in the past, I think in my very previous video, and that is a very interesting book, a historical book written and published in 1857, The Impending Crisis of the South, and How to Meet It, by uh, Rowan Hinton Helper. Right here. Impending Crisis of the South. So this is actually an interesting uh, book. If you read the back here, uh, it says, this work has been selected by scholars as being culturally important and as part of the knowledge base of civilization as we know it. This work was reproduced from the original artifact and remains as true to the original work as possible. Therefore, you will see original copy references, library stamps, as most of these works have been housed in our most important libraries around the world, and other notations in the work. This work is in the public domain in the United States of America and possibly other nations. Within the United States, you may freely copy and distribute this work as no entity, individual, or corporate has a copyright on the body of the work. Uh, as a reproduction of a historical artifact, this work may contain missing or blurred pages, poor pictures, errant marks, etc. Scholars believe and we concur that this work is important enough to be preserved, reproduced, and made generally available to the public. We appreciate your support of the preservation process, and we thank you for being an important part of keeping our knowledge relevant and alive. So it's interesting, this is a, a new, right, This I didn't buy this used, and yet, as you scroll through it, you will see that it's got, um, it's like a Xerox or a photocopy of a copy that has been marked up. Uh, in fact, I believe this particular copy, if I'm not mistaken, is from the Washington, D.C. Library. I transferred D.C. Public Library January 9th, 1934. There's a little Xerox of the stamp right there, and you can see the pages. You can actually see the margins of where the actual page was. Uh, so this is just literally a photocopy. So this is the uh, copy of, I don't know when this edition, this one that got stamped in 34, when this was actually published. I don't know if it's from the original printing or not. Probably not. Excuse me, yeah, New York, uh, Nassau Street, 1860. Yeah, so this is maybe not the original, but very close. And the copy, so it's interesting. So yeah, you read it and you can see that it's a Xerox, but it's a printed book. Um, so uh, there's no copyright. There's a couple different editions of this. I have two versions. Uh, I'd, I'd actually be curious to compare them, see if there's differences in the text, but there, this one was the more readable of the two. And so this is a really fascinating book. If you really want to get into the history of slavery in the United States, I think this is something that you absolutely have to read. And this is a perspective that is obliterated by today's political concerns. Right? The debate about what happened or how to interpret what happened is dominated for a very large extent, and regrettably so, by contemporary political uh, ideologies, which are basically not very relevant. Right, The progressive... Um, the progressivism that we have today, which dominates so much discourse and so much political discussion, it had its antecedents back then. You can still see, like, we still had the Puritans, we still had Harvard, you know, we still had Calvinism, we still had the, the elect, we still had a lot of the stuff that would eventually become the progressivism that we know today, but it was a very different thing, and it wasn't the only thing, and so the way these events were seen, viewed, and, and interpreted back then is very different than we telescope back today, and I think that's really, really important. So, Helper is an interesting character. Helper is from the South. He's from North Carolina. And he is, for lack of a better term, quite quite frankly, a, a Southern nationalist. He loves the South. He thinks the South is amazing. He uh, is a native son of there and has all these, the, the, the normal nostalgia that you have for your place of origin or birth uh, and a lot of pride in his heritage and whatnot. But he is also deeply, deeply ashamed. And he's, a sl he's ashamed... It's hard to tell exactly what he's more ashamed of. Is he more ashamed of slavery as a moral outrage, which he does think it is, but his writings are not like those of Garrison or the abolitionists. He is not coming at it from the perspective that just slavery is so uniquely evil and that's it. He's ashamed that the South is lagging far, far behind the North in terms of what we would now call industrial industrialization or the Industrial Revolution and what he called that and what we would still call today wealth. The North was much richer and more powerful than the South. And as a Southern nationalist, not in the Confederacy, because this was written before the Confederacy, he wasn't a Confederate or a believer in Southern secession, 
but the idea of pride in himself that it was um, uh, uh, absolutely embarrassing uh, and shocking that uh, the uh, that the um, South was so far behind the North in terms of their industrial capacity, in terms of their wealth, in terms of their investment, in terms of their literary abilities, in terms of their skill, in terms of the diversity of their economy. That basically the South was uh, very, uh, very weak and poor in relative to the North. And he points out that the reason he believes quite firmly, and he, the book is basically his um, eludation, eludation is why, is because of slavery. That slavery is holding the South back. That slavery has made the South poor relative to the North, that at the time when both sides had slavery, there wasn't a disparity between the two. And there's a really useful inflection point here in the revolution. If you go up to the revolution, slavery was legal basically everywhere in the United States. It wasn't abolished in any of the original 13 colonies that existed in Massachusetts and existed in New Hampshire and Connecticut and certainly existed in New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maine, um, everywhere. Now, how common it was varied from place to place, but it was legal everywhere. It was practiced everywhere. It was important everywhere. Um, and uh, then at the time of the American Revolution or in the ensuing decades, most of the northern states or all of the northern states abolished, usually with some kind of gradual, gradual abolition of slavery. New York in 1799, Massachusetts in 1780. Most of these states, and there's a really good book on this that doesn't deal with slavery called The Sovereign States about the various revolutions that happened in all the colonies, right? It wasn't just that the United States was formed. Each of the individual colonies had their own revolution, became in a sense their own sovereign states, their own sovereign countries, and created new constitutions out at those times, whether we're talking Mass or Connecticut, New York, wherever. And many of the Northern states, you know, a few of them right at the revolution, um, abolished slavery. Several others didn't do it right at the revolution, but within, say, two decades, two or three decades after. This didn't happen from Maryland South. And by the time of the Civil War, and indeed by a few decades before the Civil War, there was a very obvious distinction between North and South in terms of progress and wealth, population, industry, all these other things, innovation. Uh, and this is something that many, many people commented on. Uh, very famously, probably Alexis de Tocqueville uh, in his book, Democracy in America, says you go south of the Ohio River or south of Mason-Dixon and it's lethargic. There's no innovation. There's no entrepreneurship. It's just like a, a, a feudal backwater. If you go north of there, it's it's all progress, all innovation, uh, all, all hard work and, and, and whatnot. So he's uh, he does morally object to slavery. He says so many times. He, he ha uses biblical arguments. He says a lot of stuff that the founders had said. But it's also very clear that he really, really is upset that it, he feels that it's holding the South back, that it hurts poor whites, that it hurts even the uh, slave masters, right? That they're, that they're being held back because they own slavery, because so much of their capital is invested in human labor and not physical capital, uh, which is ultimately what's going to grow wealth, right? You, can only, you can't grow... The, the amount of wealth per person, right? The per capita wealth is not going to grow when the, the, when the standard, the, the, the basis of all labor, the basis of all wealth is labor, is human labor. If the basis of all labor is human labor, and that's the only where place that it's coming from, it's not, you can't really um, spread that. Or you're not getting more per unit, right? You have to have capital investment to start doing that. Um, so I want to really quote here. It's page... Uh, 23. This is just kind of a juxtaposition that he does between, and, and, and so a big, a big part of the book is to point out comparing, there's lots of tables, the, the, the book has many, many pages of tables comparing imports, exports, wealth, property, pro, wealth and property, wealth of various crops. So a, a big thing that was said very often, so well, cotton is this very important crop and we need slaves for cotton, which of course you don't need slaves for cotton, but he points out that other crops that didn't use slaves at all were more valuable. Uh, he points out, for instance, the hay crop in the north. If you took the value of the hay crop in the north, it was more valuable than all the cotton. I, he, he presents tables to that effect. I'm not going to say that that's absolutely true I, I, because I didn't double check. I actually did find some typos in some of his stats. So, uh, for instance, he says Lewis Cass uh, was the Secretary of State and he was from Ohio, which is false. He's from Michigan, but... Um, and so, you know, I'm not going to vouch for that, but he makes the argument that really, even when it came to agriculture, the North was more advanced than the South. But here's a, here's a quote here. Uh, the difference is simply this. At the North, everything is turned to advantage. When a tree is cut down, 
The main body is sold or used for lumber, railing, or paling. The stump for matches and shoe pegs. The knees for shipbuilding and the branches for fuel. At the south, everything and the branches. <laughs> At the south, everything is either neglected or mismanaged. Whole forests are felled by the ruthless hand of slavery. The trees are cut into logs, rolled into heaps, covered with the limbs and brush, and then burned on the identical soil that gave them birth. The land itself next falls prey to the fell destroyer, and that which was once beautiful, fertile, and luxuriant woodland is soon despoiled of all its treasures and converted into an eye-offending desert. So this is kind of his, or he's just talking about agriculture here. It's hard to compare the manufacture or the industry of the South with the North because there, there was virtually none in the South prior to the Civil War. There's actually some interesting work done that during the Civil War, the South uh, rapidly industrialized, not anywhere near as fast as the North did, but they actually did. There's actually some Marxist theorists in Europe who actually consider this of uh, the South during the Civil War to be a prime example of a rapidly industrializing society. It's something that maybe the Soviet Union should try and have emulated, but that uh, is a very, very uh, unusual take. Not that many people are familiar with that. And that was many years after this was written, so he wouldn't have been aware of that. Um, so uh, there's some problems with his analysis, I'll have to say. Uh, a lot of this reminds me of uh, Thomas Sowell's book, uh, Black Rednecks and is it White Liberals. Um, yeah. And he talks in that book about how there were very serious, very notable cultural differences between the populations who settled the you know, New England, especially, and the Mid-Atlantic versus the South, uh, and that there were cultural differences, and that it's possible that what he's seeing, because ultimately his argument that slavery is making the South poor is an argument based on correlation equals causation. Now, there is some argument as to why that is, right? There is a causal attempt to describe what's happening, but it very largely rests on that. And of course, it's a logical fallacy to say correlation equals causation. And I think that one of the things that um, something like Soul's insight might have, uh, or if you read more broadly, is that there were cultural things that made the South kind of lazy and not entrepreneurial and uh, braggadocious that incorporated slavery. There was a feudal ideology. If you read, uh, what is it? Uh, I did a book review on it earlier. American freedom of American slavery, right? The the, the idea, the, the concept of uh, a gentry that doesn't have to work and then a laboring class that does, but then there's an obligation of the gentry to then take care of the uh, slavery, uh, of, the, of the laborers, whether we're talking serfdom or feudalism or slavery in the American sense. That, that ideology carries with it the fact that the, the gentry should not have to work, should not be entrepreneurial, should not be go-getters, should not be innovating. They should just live a life of luxury pursuing uh, various different leisures and then having obligations to, towards their uh, to their people, uh, as many in the South would call their slaves. Uh, and you could say then that slavery then is just uh, an example of this broader cultural difference. And I think that's a very fair point and one that Helper, you know, I'm not sure if he's aware of it or not. Uh, it wasn't raised in his book, but uh, the point is the correlation is very high. And when he goes through looking at things like wealth per capita, um, the richest cities in, the, uh, in slavery, right? the richest cities in the South were cities that were basically in the middle that had very few slaves. So the richest two cities in the South per capita were Baltimore and uh, St. Louis, which if you know, those are border states. That's in Maryland and Missouri. Those are states that did not join the Confederacy when the war came a few years after this book was published. Uh, and the proportion of slaves in those towns is very low. It was less than 10%. I think, in fact, I think it was less than 5% in each of those cities. Places which had a much higher number of slaves were much poorer. He also talks a lot about land values, you know, because the, the idea comes with what about um, uh, restitution for the slave owners who lose their slaves? And he says, no, they can just keep their land. And if the land values in the South make up half the difference of the land values in the North, then the slave masters will be compensated for the value of the slaves many times over, which is a fair point. If you looked at, at the land prices, land values, there's a huge difference between the North and the South in favor of the North. And this doesn't make a lot of sense because really the climate's much better in the South, right? The South is much warmer. The growing season is longer. Uh, it's more productive in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I have, I've lived my entire life in both parts of the, the historic North, right? I grew up in the upper Midwest of Michigan, which at that time was just a, a new state fresh out of the Northwest territory. And that part of the country is actually very fertile. Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, 
those areas that's the bread that's one of the bread baskets of the world but it was barely developed at that point but the old north new england that's not the case at all new hampshire massachusetts vermont maine uh upstate new york to a large extent these places are not particularly fertile they're not very good for agricultural and yet and yet they were much more productive relative to the south per acre and even in absolute terms even though the land area was slightly smaller and that's another thing that comes across in Soul's book, uh, Black Rednecks uh, and White Liberals, because he talks about the average uh, investment in a farm, the average value of a farm. And it's just always been the case that a Vermont farm, a New Hampshire farm, or a Massachusetts farm out, vastly outproduces a farm in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, or Alabama. And there isn't a good reason for that other than a cultural one, right? Because you can actually grow more in the South and they actually have more land, more bottomlands, more fertile soil. The soil in, in New England especially is awful. Uh, it's, it's, it's nothing. I, this is less true with, say, the Midwest, which is actually pretty fertile in a, in a very, I mean, if you've ever been to the Midwest, you know what I'm talking about. It's cornfields as far as you can see even today. That was new back then. And he, it's even interesting, interesting, too, where he juxtaposes, you know, at the time of the revolution, you had parity. The South had as many people as much wealth, it was producing most of the political power. And yet, as soon as the revolution happens, and slavery is essentially gradually or immediately abolished in the North, there is a uh, an inflection point and the North starts taking off in a way that the South just never really did. And it gets to the point where much newer states in the North far surpass original states in the South. So of course, the, the richest, most powerful, most established state in the South was Virginia, and it would also, by the way, is like basically, other than Maryland, the most northern and the least southern of the southern slave-owning states. It was the state that had the most um, emancipationist fervor for the longest time. There were actually serious debates about emancipation in Virginia up until the early 1830s, 1833, the Nat Turner Rebellion. Uh, and yeah, if you compare that, Ohio had more people, Ohio had more wealth, Ohio had uh, more industry, and yet Ohio is much younger. It's almost 200 years younger. Uh, Virginia was started out as a colony in 1607. Ohio becomes a state in 1801. Uh, like so, there's there's 150, 200 year difference in the settlement patterns, and yet they overtake the, these the, the most powerful, like in this Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Chicago, Michigan. All these states just completely surpass the most powerful states in the South, like that, and his conclusion that he reached, and it's not one that was unique to him, was that it must be slavery because there's no other good reason. Like they have rivers in the South, they have coasts in the South, they have mineral wealth, they have agricultural wealth, they have everything going for them for this to work. And yet they're falling more and more behind. And so he's coming at it and he has this, these parables where he talks about like how much pride, um, how much pride the uh, South has in itself. But they're like, yeah, but that Southerner who's so proud about himself, like, when they, when they write a book in the South, it gets printed in the North, the paper's made in the North, uh, their tools are made in the North, their clothing is made in the North, their uh, furniture is made in the North. Uh, when they're born, they're put into uh, you know, a Northern stroller. They ride around in Northern carriages with Northern buggy whips, with shoe, horseshoes made in the North. And when they're buried, they're buried with a tombstone made from New England and buried with a spade made in Connecticut and blah, 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 blah. And like, we don't make anything down here. But see, it was even so bad that like some of the states, when they would pass their laws, like every, you know, every year Mississippi legislature would pass another law, they would very often go to Boston to have those laws printed. They would go to Boston like, okay, here's our laws. You guys do the printing because nobody in Mississippi is really up to the task of, of printing the legislative enactments of the state. Uh, and he just goes on and on and on and on down the line. And so he said, even when there is talent, even when there are good writers in the South, and he admits there are good writers in the South, um, they just don't have the infrastructure, the, the skill, um, because, <laughs> what did he say? There's a, he had a good line. He's like, they're so, uh, Southerners are so used to getting labor for free that they're not willing to pay for good skill, right? They don't want to have to shell out to get somebody who's actually good at something because they're, they're used to having a penurious, you know, Negro who will do whatever they say at, you know, half effort, um, that, that they have to pay for their retirement and their upbringing and everything. And then they just accept when they're lazy, which they are understandably lazy, like as much as they possibly can be. And who, who can blame them? Nobody can, even, even the masters can blame them for that. Uh, and so then when you come up, well, if you really want to do well, if you want to have, uh, a skilled occupation, skilled artisans, if you want to be competitive in industry, you have to attract quality labor and to do that you have to pay 
and you have to pay a market rate. And they just were against that idea. Like they, they, they you grow up in this position. He talks about growing up as a child. You see how your parents treat the slaves. You think, okay, this is how I interact with people. Um, he then goes into, oh, I should find that quote. That was really good. Let's see, let's see if I find this. Try to try and remember the pages, but. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'll get to these. Uh... What about New Orleans? So New Orleans, yeah. New Orleans is the largest city by population in the South. There's no question. And it was a large port. It was not very wealthy per capita. So that was the, that was the thing there. So yes, there was a, New Orleans was the largest city by population in the South. No question. And it was a large port. I mean, it's the entrepot of the largest in, uh, continental river system in the world then and now, but it was not very wealthy per capita and did not have a lot of industry. Uh, so yes. Uh, and it was also an extreme outlier. I think the population at the time of the Civil War was like 250,000, which made it something like, if it wasn't four or five times bigger, it might have even been 10 times bigger than the next largest city in the South. But it was not a very wealthy city per capita. That's a totally fair thing to point out Louisiana. Um, audio is too low. Okay, let me turn this up, guys. All right, let's read this. So, like... This And this comes from, and I'm going to say why I think this book is important today, because it's an important antidote to a lot of the arguments that are being uh, telescoped back. Um, but one of the, this is a less common argument. People say, well, look, slavery is capitalist. The type of slavery that existed in the South was heavily, heavily subsidized. You could not criticize slavery legally. You couldn't publish books against slavery. This book was banned. People were killed for distributing this book in the South. They were executed by the state for distributing this book. The mail was not allowed to sell or to, to distribute abolitionist literature, you couldn't get the liberator, you couldn't send the liberator, um, you couldn't manumit slaves, there are all kinds of regulations against manumitting slaves. There's a lot of stuff in here too, a lot of quotes by people like John Randolph of Roanoke, Jefferson, Henry Clay. A lot of these guys, they owned slaves, they inherited slaves, and a lot of them thought slavery was wrong, and yet they couldn't manumit their slaves. It was very difficult to do that legally, and if they did, freedmen were expelled from the South because they didn't want to have a population growing up in the South that might be sympathetic to the slaves. So, you know, a free black population would be the obvious one. It would also be harder to control the slaves when they have a free population that is not black. And so these populations were severely restricted in the North as well. It should be fair to point that out. And I've done videos on that and there's lots of great books on that. But in the South, in, in the North, that was white supremacy and racism. In the South, it was a subsidy to slavery. But here's a quote. This is something else that isn't as well known. This is a quote. Uh, this is from a native of North Carolina, uh, written in March 19th, 1857. Uh, Here I am, a poor but sober and industrious man with a family dependent on me for support, and after I have finished my day's labor, I am compelled to walk the streets from nine in the evening until three in the morning to restrain the roving propensitalities uh, of the other people's property, quote, niggers. Why should I thus be deprived of sleep that the slaveholder slaveholder may slumber? I frankly acknowledge my indebtedness to you for opening my eyes upon the subject. The more I think and see of my slavery, the more I detest it. I become yeah. So, so this is a guy who's involved in what uh, we now call the slave patrols. So people were drafted essentially by the states to form patrols to you know stop slave insurrection. But the people getting drafted are not slave owners, and the people being taxed to support them, if they are getting supported at all are not necessarily the slave owners either. So you're being forced to help uh, protect the property of others, the uh, chattel of others. Um, I can't believe I remember the page that was on. Um, yeah, and he goes on from there. There's there's extensive, he, about, I would say probably like 10% of this book is him quoting other people. Um, duh, duh. Duh, duh, duh. So, uh, yeah, he's very, I mean, he, he doesn't like slavery. He's definitely a white supremacist. Like, uh, this guy is not a, all the races are equal, anything like that. It's not kumbaya. He's not an abolitionist in that sense. I mean, he is, he is an abolitionist explicitly. He says he is. He defines a term, and he wants all slavery to be ended right away with no remuneration for the, um, uh, or no restitution. He doesn't believe that he can have restitution because you can't own man legally. But he talks about the slave owners would still do fine because they would just 
still on their land and their land values would probably go up. They could just hire out their labor. And this is kind of the interesting thing if you compare this or if you uh, juxtapose this with somebody like uh, Fitzhugh, who um, is, is basically arguing the same thing from the oppor- opposite, opposite perspective, where he sees, yes, slavery makes the masters poorer. Slavery is, a, is an obligation and a burden on the, on the master, and it's an assurance for the slave. They don't have to worry about their retirement. They don't have to worry about savings. They don't have to worry about budgeting, any of that stuff. They just have to put in their, their nine to five, and then they get three hots and a cot for life. Easy peasy Japanese, what more could you want? Um, I mean, there's a whole argument of, about what more you could want there and the hypocrisy of somebody who's free, just saying that to somebody who's not free. Uh, but the point being that uh, the, the, the labor of the slave is not very efficient. And if you were able to use the land more intensively and more efficiently, and the labor more efficiently, you would actually end up being wealthier in the long run. And uh, I think that that is uh, a, an argument that people were making at the time. It's not necessarily the moral argument that people want to make when it comes to slavery, but it's still a powerful one. But so I think why, why this is important, though, is that uh, right now, starting in the 30s, you start to have Marxist writers. I forget the name, but there was a Marxist writer, I believe, in Barbados, who came up with this idea that the sin of slavery was a stain on capitalism, right? That the market capitalism was created by slavery and dependent on slavery. And this is an idea that has not spread very far in the general population, it has become really popular among Marxists in fucking Harvard. Or I've, I've, I've had communists at Harvard tell me this thing. And they believe that that uh, slavery was really important to capitalism. And there's many reasons why that's ridiculous. On its face, I mean, the, the many of them believe that like the Industrial Revolution is because of slavery. And of course, if that was true, then the Industrial Revolution sort of started as soon as the Neolithic Revolution happened. Because that's when slavery, as we can recognize it today, began, if not before. Uh, and there's so many other periods in history that had massive amounts of slaves, classical Rome, classical Greece, the Muslim, you know, the Muslim Emirates, the, the Barbary coasts, uh, all through Native Americans had slavery, blah, 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 on, 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 on. How come they didn't have it? And then even the North Atlantic slave trade, which I was, you know, uh, very dutifully informed by my Harvard date, was a very specific event, even though it goes from 1450 and ends in 1880 and covers the Atlantic Ocean and four continents. He describes this half millennium of economic existence as a specific event. Um, why then did it, the Industrial Revolution not begin in Brazil or Lisbon, right? Because Brazil had the most slaves for the longest time, and the Portuguese were the first and the longest slave traders. Why then did it begin in Manchester, England, right? The English did have a slave trade, but they weren't trading many of them to Manchester. And within the United States, why did it happen? I mean, I can, I can, I've been to the spot where the Industrial Revolution began in the United States, and it was in Lowell, Massachusetts, on the Merrimack River, 20 miles from where I'm sitting right here, and it started in 1820, which is 40 years after slavery was abolished in, in Massachusetts, right? If, if slavery is the key thing, then, then the Industrial Revolution in the United States should have been epicentered in the Chesapeake, or maybe in the Mississippi Delta, but not in New England, certainly not in uh, Massachusetts or New Hampshire, which were some of the first states to abolish slavery and to get rid of it and have the few smallest impact. So there is this idea. The other problem was that, of course, when slavery is abolished at the at the end of the Civil War in 1865, does capitalism take a huge hit? And the answer is obviously not. Capitalism did just fucking fine without slavery. And then the other problem, too, they might argue about false consciousness, but the capitalists in the country grew to eventually hate slavery. Now, there were the cotton Whigs, there were people, there were nationalists in the North who did not want to have a civil war about slavery, and so they were willing to accommodate it to a very large degree for that reason. But they did not need slavery, and they did not love slavery in that sense, and they were happy to see it go when it left. Uh, so this is important. And we have people, I was just actually watching Ibram Kendi to speaking to Congress. You know, So Ibram Kendi very at you know one of the, the chief anti-racists out here i've got his books on the shelf they will be coming up very soon for those of you who are interested in that but he talks about um he cite he cites this history and uh, historian uh is it robert baptiste which one is he i read his book uh the half has never been told yes he cites this book the half has never been told uh by edward baptiste excuse me and you know i like that book that's a good book there's a lot of interesting stuff that's worth being in there but edward baptiste is not a legitimate historian right he's not a respected historian 
He doesn't know that much about slavery. He doesn't know that much about history. He knows nothing about economics, right? But he's he's a, he's a I don't want to say he's a communist, but he's definitely a progressive, a socialist, and a left winger. And he doesn't know anything about economics other than he has a vague feeling that uh, um, uh, John Maynard Keynes is the greatest historian ever. He literally says that in that book, um, or one of the greatest um, uh, economists ever. And um, they want to telescope back all these political, oh, let's condemn, it's, it's very funny. Slavery absolutely um, condemns capitalism, free markets, but not the Democratic Party, not the federal government, not the state governments, uh, not regulations, not unions, right? Even though, yeah, I mean, the Democratic Party especially is the most glaring. I mean, they, but it's this very selective original sin, um, which, so they will say, it's attached to everything that they don't like, which these re revolutionary Marxists, it's quite a few things in our society, whether it's the church, the family, sometimes I'll say nationalism, or it depends, um, and... and Certainly, capitalism, factories, all that, wage labor. Though that's all sla that's all tainted with slavery, and then all the socialist things that we love, even the things that were directly involved with slavery, those things are not tainted. Um, and so a book like Helpers is a great antidote to that because you read the book and you're like, no, slavery was not necessary for capitalism, and it was not making capitalism richer. It was making the people who exercised it and lived by it much poorer. They were poorer than everybody else. Like the South was, and this is a, a, a great not secret about the Civil War. Everybody who knows anything about the Civil War, you, you're, you're a third grader and you know a little bit about the Civil War. What do you know? The North was much more powerful than the South. The North had way more people and way more industrial might and way more wealth. Like orders of magnitude, they were like different countries. They were radically different countries in terms of their industrial ability, their, their uh, ability to wage war, all these other things, their innovation, all this stuff. And so... If, 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 if slavery is the genesis or the linchpin or the, the key detail there, then that doesn't make any, it doesn't even correlate. And this is, you can get, it's funny, you can, you can call, you can make anything correlate with anything else by adjusting the scale, right? If you adjust the scope, you can just say, well, uh, slavery did happen in uh, Saudi Arabia, it, you know, in the 15th century, and that's still on planet Earth, and capitalism also came up on planet Earth, so therefore they're, you know, intimately connected. Right, and so this, this what they believe is a sophisticated critique of capitalism is based on just the most uh, um, unfocused, broad definitions uh, of correlates here. Uh, again, they don't really correlate. The slavery is not very popular in the Merrimack Valley. It never was. It certainly wasn't at the time that the Industrial Revolution started, and it certainly wasn't in the decades that the North just completely left the South in the dust. So... There we go, guys. I highly recommend the book as an antidote to that. Uh, don't think that because uh, somebody like Edward Baptiste gets cited that he's an authority. He's not. I have a lot of problems with the more traditional authorities, like people like James McPherson and Henry Jaffa. I think those guys are, are, are guided by their own politics, but they're not trying, they don't have a political axe to grind today. So when you read McPherson's book, Battle Cry of Freedom, you know, McPherson is a New Deal Democrat. He loves big government. And when he looks at what Lincoln does, um, he he justifies it and rationalizes it. But he still reports what he does. So you could say, you know, he did suspend habeas corpus. He did throw, he did throw newspaper editors and Congress people in, in prison, right, and, and declare martial law. So he's, at least he's telling you what happened to an extent. And so you could say, you know, you know it's, it's, it's fine, McPherson, that you're really happy with that and comfortable with that. And at some point, he even lets the the bag slip a little bit and says, well, you know, if we're going to have a big government, we, we need a, a powerful federal state. And, you know, so it's good, but I can, I can, I can see their bias there and it's fine. But what, what people like Baptiste are doing and Ibram Kendi and them, they're completely, they're making up in a, com a completely erroneous version of what happened, omitting everything that's contrary to that. Things like this book, you would think that this book would be something, well, if we want to talk about hi the history of slavery, you know, this is a book that people were killed. To, uh, to spreading this book around. The, the Republican Party in 1860 mass printed this book and dis distributed this campaign material. Of course, not in the South. They couldn't even get Lincoln on the ballot in the South. I mean, people want to talk about the elections can't be fraudulent. We have elections in 1860 and Lincoln's not even on the ballot in 10 states. So, uh, th this books like this are a great antidote to uh, this, this um, point that a lot of uh, progressive Marxist left-wing, whatever you want to say, critical theorists, right? And that's the whole point of the critical theory 
you deconstruct the things you don't like completely. You know, if, if every point that you make that is failed, you just go to another level. Like, okay, at some point they're just going to say words don't mean anything, so capitalism fails, right? But then they won't say that about Marxism. They won't say words don't mean anything, therefore the labor theory of value or the law of value is completely wrong. So, all right, guys, let me go through get some of these guys. I had a feeling you guys want to talk about something other than this, uh, but uh, I just read it. I think it's a good book, and yeah, so. Uh, without the Civil War, I am without doubt the slave tractor would have made uh, I mean, the tractor would have made slavery obsolete. Reconstruction held back the South for a hundred years. Now it's social engineering. Hey Alexander, study hard. I heard they are revamping your show, Dexter. I heard that as well. We're going to finish it off. People were not satisfied with the way it ended. And yes, I get compared to Dexter Morgan very frequently. And I have for years since the show was out. Um, uh, talk about the election and possible rigging. Uh, I mean, to me, the, the, there's so much at stake in elections like this. And there's so little oversight. And it's the case of the watcher watching the watcher. But the idea that there's not election rigging is just laughable to me. The question is how much and where and exactly and how, and, and, and I don't know. Um, I assume, I just I just find that credible. We have too many historical ca cases of it. There's too many fishy things. I remember um, apparently one of, uh, in the 2004 election, anticipating what had happened in Florida in 2000, uh, you know, both sides lawyered up big time before the election. They, had, they hired a whole bunch of people who were, you know, what if we're going to have to litigate this in some state, Florida, or wherever? And the night of the election, they're all, some of these lawyers are in the room with Kerry, um, you know, waiting for this to happen. And somebody mentions that in, in, in New Mexico, uh, every precinct that used Diebold electric voting machines went for, for Bush, and every district that didn't went for Kerry. And that there's just no statistical way that's possible. And then it was understood in the room that that's what's going on, and that Kerry was just completely blase about it. He just it didn't bother him. Um, an anecdote and one that I'm not going to, I'm not prepared to verify here. It's something I saw somebody say, right. But like, um, I, I just think that that's absolutely happens. I think it happens all the time. Uh, and, uh, I'm sure it happened this time and did it make a difference in this election? Very well might've, I don't know though, for sure. Uh, abolitionists were censored like what nationalists today. Uh, no, I, I, there's some parallels there broken right before, but I think it's forced because abolitionists were actually getting killed. Uh, by the state, they were being executed uh, by states. Uh, it was illegal to ship that stuff in the mail. So yes, you do have some censorship going on from the private um, uh, by these, these big social media networks. And I don't want to minimize that, and they walk this private public line in a way that is kind of quite fascistic, really. And so I, I'm open to criticizing them, and their hypocrisy here is obvious with this election. I'm just blatantly obvious with this election that every single thing about Russia Gate is true and fine and spread everywhere. And then anything critical of Joe Biden is hushed away and right. So I, I get that, but you're not getting lynched. Uh, you're not getting tarred and feathered. You're not getting killed. Uh, there aren't legal prescriptions, whatever you want to say about the fascistic public private partnership of social media. And there's a, a, an honest discussion to be had there. It's not the actual state. So yeah, some parallels. Sure. And there certainly has been an inflection there or, or, or reversal, but I, I don't think you want to take that too far. Um, they couldn't sell abolitionist books in the South. They couldn't, you could not even sell, you couldn't mail it, right? The, like if you, if you mailed the liberator to somebody in the South, you would be you were guilty of a crime and the, the mail carrier would be guilty of a crime. The recipient would be guilty of a crime. Uh, so yeah, they were quite serious about that. And that, that really starts in the 1830s. The 1830s, the early 1830s, is a really important inflection point. Up until that point, you had a lot, most of the abolitionist societies in the United States were in the South. Most of the people who were talking about abolishing slavery were in the South. And you look at the generation of the founding fathers and the generation immediately after that, the idea that you should emancipate slaves or we should do, be doing something to end slavery was widespread. Right? I mean, we all, everyone knows about Jefferson talking about this. Everyone knows about Washington, um, you know, uh, manumitting his slaves. But even the next generation, people like Henry Clay, right? Henry Clay owned slaves. 
He was originally from Virginia, but then became a very, very long time, very powerful politician from Kentucky for the first half of the 18th century. And he frequently, he introduced bills in, in the House of Kentucky and in Virginia to abolish slavery. And uh, in the 1830s, and people debate why this is, some people say the Nat Turner Rebellion, some people say it's the Liberator, and, and William Henry Harrison, or I'm sorry, William, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, who made it suddenly not polite to be an abolitionist in South Carolina. There's, there's debates here, and I don't know exactly what. We just know that there was an inflection where it no longer became safe to criticize slavery in the South. It wasn't politely allowed. He talks about this in the book, that there's this uh, massive censorship. And he also, also interesting, this is a more applicable today. He says this kind of censorship of thought stultifies the mind, right? The fact that you can publish anything you want in Boston about anything that you want in Boston or New York or wherever else, um, means that there's actually intellectual discussion, there's actually debate, there's actually progress being made in all these different fields, and there's just none of that happening in the South, because, yes, it's this one issue, but by that one issue, then every, you end up in this pattern of conformity with everything else. Um, I want to start restoring where to begin and which device. I have a whole video on which, uh, which, um, which foreskin restoration uh, device should I use. But, but what is the book called? The Impending Crisis of the South by William Rowan Helper. Yeah, South America had a more entrenched slave system and yet it's more poor. Yeah, this is, again, I've, I've repeated this anecdote repeatedly, but I went on a date with a communist who teaches at Harvard or did at the time. I don't know if he still does. We're walking around Boston, and he's just like, I feel so guilty that slavery created all of this. And I'm like, all of what? Like, what building? Like, and there are some, there are some buildings in, in, in Massachusetts, in, in Boston that predate the revolution. There are. There's a few. Um, what percentage of the capital or the wealth of Boston today was built before the revolution? It must be some small percentage less than one. It's probably in the 0.001%, right? Because Paul Revere's house ultimately is not that valuable relative to the aggregate capital. But the other thing is not everything built before the revolution even used slave. Slavery was not very common in the North, not very common in Boston. It did exist, but it was very rare. So I don't know what percentage of that it was. Be, it would only be a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. But as I... If we were walking on the streets of Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro, would you say that? And he's like, no. But I'm like, but Brazil had more slaves for a longer time. Like, like slavery is demonstrably more important to the history of Brazil than it is to the United States. Same for Angola. Same for Saudi Arabia and Mauritania. Same for Portugal. Same for Cuba. Uh, so why, like, why is that? There, there's just an obvious double standard. There's just a blatantly obvious double standard that they don't have a good answer for. Not one that it was good to me. I, I was very fortunate. I literally read a book on slavery in Latin America like the week before I met that guy. That's why you read books like that. Jesus. Um, Swedenborg, Demarest, Switzerland, all had, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Um, have you read Fauner's book on Reconstruction? So I have a shelf on Reconstruction. I haven't read any of them, and I'm not sure if I have Fauner's. So what book is the antidote to um, Baptist's book? That would be American Slavery, American Freedom. Uh -huh. American Slavery, American Freedom by Edward Morgan. All right, this is this I consider a much better book on the history of slavery, how it began, the ideology behind it. Baptiste is writing a polemic that is intense that is about political debates right now. It's laced with this uh, grievance theology uh, of this critical race theory. It's filled with that, and it's telescoping those. It's it's trying to look at history and create an argument for today by 
misrepresenting what happened in the past. The guy is not a, I mean, there's good stuff in there. Like he brings up things that are worth thinking about and knowing about. And if you don't know anything about slavery, you will learn some stuff about slavery in his book that you did not know before, which is great. You know, like the, about the, sh the transfer of the slaves from the Chesapeake to the Deep South and the Cuffel system and all things like that. Those are those are important things to know. They're worth knowing, but it's just tainted with this axe to grind politically, and it's it's totally misconstrued. And so, this is a much more intellectually honest and and eye opening book. You'll understand slavery more from this. You understand more about the contemporary political um, beliefs of Edward Baptiste by reading his book than you do about slavery. Uh, socialism is anti-slavery just against private owned slaves people are state owned yeah and this was the big I mean Fitzhugh was like slavery is the perfect form of socialism the, the, the two are the same they want the same thing uh For rhetorical purposes, right-wing people should refer to gulags and collective farms as public slavery. As hot as well, that's a totally accurate way to describe it. it. Well, to the extent that you can construe the state or the Bolshevik political party as "quote unquote" the public, uh, I'll quibble there. But yeah, it's a fair point. The Impending Crisis of the South is one of my favorite books. Well, Broke Capitalist, thank you. I mean, I, th I think you said you heard me mention it years ago, but I'll be honest and say it was you talking about it that got me to finally actually read it um, and end up with two copies of it. So, yes, it's absolutely, if you want to know about the history of the United States, the Civil War, and slavery, you have to read that book. I mean, I just don't see how you can... And I, I'm not even saying I agree with every argument in it, and, like, I, I, found, I found mistakes... You know, and I shouldn't be able to do that from a book that was published in 1857, but there are mistakes in there. Um, but uh, it's still a cogent thing, right? This is a powerful book. It's why the fucking, it's why the Republicans mass printed it in 1860, and it's why the South banned it and killed people for distributing it. Um, uh, have you got a chance to start reading cynical theories? It's very thorough. It's not just uh, your average political anti-SJW book. It seems very well researched. So I have it on the shelf. I'm debating if I should read that before or after. I kind of want to read the critical race theory stuff before and then read cynical theories. Um, so no, I have not started yet and I've been debating when I want to throw it in. It'll be soon. I want to get through all this critical race stuff relatively soon. Um, so we'll get there. Right now I'm going to read the 1619 Project by Magnuson. Um, Magnus. This, this is next because this is short. Critique by Philip Magnus. Who I think I just met at Porkfest a couple years ago. This looks pretty short though, so this will be easy to read. Uh, how pathetic is Trump now that he throws a tantrum because he lost? Well, he's been throwing tantrums all along, so, you know, if you're going to throw a tantrum it's after you lose the presidency, I think that's a fair time to do it. Considering cynical theories is still sold on Amazon, I doubt it gives the correct shot. Well, maybe it's correct. I think you're being logically unfair here, Brooke. Microphone. He could be correct and simply not say everything that you wish he would say, right? I mean, if you're going to say he's incorrect by omission, perhaps. Um, I mean, you can still buy Mein Kampf on fucking Amazon, so... Thaddeus Russell put on a tweet that he thinks a dozen counties, a dozen only, uh, were rigged, and he thinks there's a 50% chance it will lead to Biden's impeachment, imprisonment. Well, that would be awesome. I would absolutely love to see a sitting president put in prison. Um, people are, keep asking about this. Listen, I didn't follow this super closely, but I'll say this. I hate them both. I would prefer Trump to Biden. There's no question about that. Um, but Biden is basically the very best we could ever hope for. He's senile. He's weak. And he's weak. Like, Obama was popular, man. People fucking loved Obama. People worshipped Obama's feet. They still suck his dick. Nobody feels that way about Biden. 
Nobody feels about that way about Biden, and his fucking VP is clearly is clearly uh, a diversity hire. Like, so she doesn't come. Like, Biden had political power, right? When him when he got selected as VP under Obama, it was because he brought some political clout to the table. Kamala Harris does not have that. She's just a diversity hire. She's just the black girl, and everybody knows it. Like everybody knows that, and. Biden is old, and this is far too close of an election. He can't walk away with it and be like, I'm the king, I won, the way kind of Obama might have been able to do, or the way that indeed Trump could do after his very strong defeat. Uh, You know, he won to the extent that there wasn't cheating, and I'm not saying there wasn't. I'm pretty sure there was. It's just a question of how much. Um, You know, everybody was against Trump. The entire media, blah, blah, blah. You have this pandemic, you have the economy that goes with the pandemic, rightly or wrongly, but that's just how people act, right? It wasn't it wasn't Hoover's fault that there was a depression. It was Hoover's fault that they exacerbated the depression. It was FDR's fault for making it far worse. But people didn't perceive it that way. And people are so so I don't know. But there's there's a ton of people are skeptical about this election. And I think Biden is gonna be weak. There's gonna be a, a Republican Senate, so his ability to do anything I mean like like Obviously, you know, gun owner, I, I hate the Democrats when it comes to gun control. But, you know, Obama had eight years. He got shit. He got shit all. He didn't get anything for that. And if Obama couldn't do it, then Biden is very unlikely to do it. Uh, he doesn't have anything close to a mandate. So if we're going to have, we have to have a president, you know, so be it. This would be the, the best scenario. I mean, unless, unless Trump was going to, I mean, again, I would, if I had to pick, I would pick Trump over Biden and I would. You would like to think, well, this is last year, so maybe Trump will do some real crazy good stuff, but we don't know that. Um, I The other thing that I kept thinking about, there are two, two things that kept coming up. One, the irony of, of him campaigning and writing the fucking crime bill that threw all those black people in prison for drugs, and now he's the woke, you ain't black if you don't vote for me. But even more than that, the fucking guy voted for the Iraq war, and I'm fucking tired. Like, that was so, everything about that was wrong. And Trump doesn't have culpability for that. Obama didn't at the time. He does now, as is you know, as he as for what he did as president. And Biden does with what he did as vice president, and he did for what he did in Senate for voting for it. He's an absolute piece of shit, and I cannot believe the people who are old enough to remember that. Who that just means not like whatever Trump did, whatever you want to say Trump did, it's not that bad compared to that supporting the Iraq War. That's the worst thing. And he just, that wasn't even an issue people even talked about. But I have a long memory, right? I'm a history buff. And I'm like, yeah, he's a fucking war criminal. Uh, and he's seen, <laughs> it's just funny, he's seen all. So, like, I don't know. Uh, You look like a more attractive Ron Perlman. Well, I'm about half his age, so. Uh, monetary positive US, no. What do you think of the civil lines? I just outlined them. I think he's going to be a very weak president. He doesn't have a lot of legitimacy. He may get impeached. I hope that's true. That would be awesome. Um, <laughs> The 1619 project lame. I want the 69 project. Yeah, Obama, I mean, when people talk about Obama being a great speaker or whatever, I, that never appealed to me. I always thought, I mean, when you listen to him, it's like, that doesn't make any sense. That's a lie. He's full of shit. That's very empty rhetoric, blah, blah, blah. But, but it, he delivered it in a way that your average, you know, uh, rationally ignorant voter found appealing, right? He drew huge crowds. And people were really psyched about him. They're still really psyched about him. You know, he could he he could do no wrong. I don't know so much about Biden. They don't love Biden. They just hate Trump. It's anybody but Trump. And so they're all this. We got to get somebody, even if he's a fucking has dementia. We'll do that. Okay, uh, but they're not really in love with him. And right, that's good, I guess. Trump will not step down. That will be very interesting. Which wars are you looking forward to being resumed? Yeah, that will be all of them. I was listening to Scott Horton talk about this, and apparently all the people that Biden's bringing in for his 
cabinet are just all of the what do they call the um, national security Democrats. So these are these are these are the sophisticated neocons, the Brzezinski's of the world, right? These these guys, the Grand Chessboard, the people who want us to have bases in every fucking country for you know humanitarian reasons, obviously. Um, there may be uh, a hair better on Palestine, maybe, but probably not. Um, and they're bad about everything else, right? Um, well, Trump is, is demonstrably better on these things, even though he wasn't great either. Um, cool story about my comp. Well, it's out there. It's legal. You can buy it. You can get whatever version you want. I don't know what you want me to say. Well, this is a, the thing about the other thing is like people really hated Hillary Clinton. I really hated Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton is one of the most ha easily hateable, hate deserving people ever. And Biden is, I mean, he's a piece of shit, but he just, he's a fuddy duddy. It's, he comes across that way, right? I don't know, you know, maybe in the 70s he'd seen more with it or whatever, but. You know, there's a lot of people who made sure to vote. I mean, so, I mean, all of you know I live in New Hampshire, but I'm originally from Michigan. I moved here seven years ago. I've not been, re I haven't registered to vote here. My, my license is here. I've, I've a firm, well-established, long-established New Hampshire residency. And I was getting ballots in the mail from Michigan, like, all fall, from Michigan. Okay, so... <laughs> I guess I should have used it. Yeah, Trump stopped US support for ISIS. They collapsed. Um, so apparently, um, Biden was not eager about that either, but as vice president, he can't really do much about it. And as a, as a senile old president with not a lot of personal charisma, he's going to do whatever they say, and they're going to be all about Getting rid of Assad, it sounds like, so. My favorite thing is that Biden supporters were the ones threatening to end friendships over Trump. Yeah, I'm not even sure, I mean, are, are, are the mistranslations in Mein Kampf supposed to make it, like, less anti-Semitic, or what? I don't, I don't understand. Like... And again, your logic there is wrong. Just because something's sold on Amazon doesn't mean it must be wrong or it can't be right. There's a lot of stuff on there that is right. You know, sure, they censor some things, but they don't only quote censor the truth. And it's not like everything on there that must be untrue. Like, don't let your cynicism get the best of you completely. They're going to be very hawkish. The CIA is going to run a Brian presidency. That's probably correct. So. You know, I did say I would favor a Trump presidency, and that's probably the biggest single reason. I do not think Trump is going to go to war with Iran. Uh, they, he seemed to be quite able and quite willing to de-escalate that situation when needed. They flirted with it, they played with it, but I don't think he wants to go to war there. So guys, I've got plans tonight, but you know, I kind of was deliberately kind of staying back from the election. I didn't follow it too terribly closely. I didn't watch it the night that it happened. I didn't know even know what was going on until maybe two days later. People were asking me what I thought about it. Um, I mean, yeah. So, yeah, I, look, I, people are going to do what they're going to do. The president's going to do what he's going to do. Um, oh, Biden's the very best we can hope for in the sense that he's weak, he's senile, that his, his VP is clearly a diversity hire who got trounced in the primaries, just trounced in the primaries. Like, it's funny. They, they, I think Jimmy Dore would say, why do they pick losers, right? Why do they pick losers? No, I, I, I don't, it just it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense that they pick the people that they pick. Like it, it, it's a good it's a good indication that it's the primary process is illusory to a very large extent.
Yeah, I didn't vote. Didn't bother to vote. It's not worth your time, really, in almost every situation. No, I did not vote for Joe Jorgensen. You know, obviously she's a, I don't know that much about her, but there's no way she's not way better than either one of them. But yeah, it was funny too, because I had people who were saying stuff like, if Trump wins, that proves that it's Russian interference. So like, they're, the election hasn't even happened and they're saying that it, it must have been uh, Russian interference, even though there's, it hasn't even happened. There's no evidence to that. Um, it's also interesting the people who are like, Trump is wrecking our our democracy. By the way, let's abolish the Electoral College uh, and pack the Supreme Court. So, do you think that Kamala Harris will become as despised as Hillary Clinton over time? No. And the reason is I don't think she is as motivated or capable as Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton has been absolutely laser-focused her entire adult life. She formed an incredibly dynamic and powerful political partnership with her husband, Bill Clinton, uh, and the two of them together, and they were a team and they worked together and they, for good or ill, deserve that that pairing. Um, you know, I think that she was absolutely ruthless and committed and she was far, far better at it than Harris uh, is. Now, maybe Harris will get better, but I doubt it. Um, you know, that was a, a uniquely powerful political dynasty. Uh, is Trump going to leave office? I presume so, uh, but we will see. And are we on the edge of a Bolshevik revolution? No. I don't think that there is. I think that the, the communists that we have in the United States, are, I don't want to... We, we don't want to make the mistake of not taking them seriously because... Bolshevism is, is not a joke, but I don't think that they have a chance in hell. Um, part of me is almost like a, I want them to try so that they can um, fail in a way that they won't be a problem in the future, if that makes any sense. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I don't think... I, well, everything's probabilistic, so I don't want to say never, but I want to say it's a very low possibility. It's very, very low. Hair looking thick for my age. What does that even mean? <laughs> so, look for more books. 16 month, 16, 19 project will be next. That's short. And then I think I'm going to do either how to be an anti-racist or critical race theory next. Probably critical race theory should be next. And I do want to do cynical theories. Absolutely. I just, I'm waiting. I, I think I want to read the actual stuff first and then read it. Um, I think this election is going to help damage people's view on legitimacy of democracy. Fraud, how Biden got elected, how Kamala got her position, etc. I think you're absolutely wrong. I think you're absolutely correct. I think that, that is definitely one of the silver lines. This has happened. It happened with just Trump anyway. It's happening even more now. Um, and uh, and it's also discrediting the media. They're, they're so obviously biased um, and demonstrably so. Um, yeah. Do you think Biden will run for a second term, assuming he makes it through his first? He says that he won, and yeah, that you can't trust their promises. But he is—he is very old, um, and I—I I think it's obvious that he's declining. So um, I don't think so. I'm kind of curious. Like, what's the book about him? Yesterday's man. I mean, he's, his time really passed. Speaking from a country where we had communism and I had family deported in Siberia, I think you guys have bigger fish to fry than communism, socialism, whatever. What would be a bigger fish here? And what country are we talking about, Vlad? Are you from Romania? With a name like Vlad. As, of course, your middle name is Tudor, so like, who knows? The 
neoliberals. I hate that term. Okay, so the big powerful people here aren't the communists, they're the progressives, right? Progressivism uh, and I, progressivism and Marxism are cousins. They're very related to each other, but they're not descended from each other. They influenced, uh, I think, because Marxists took over the Soviet Union, created the Soviet Union, they, they had an outsized influence to their intellectual contributions. And I do think that they've had an influence on progressive thinking, but they are, they don't control it. And there is an independence there. Um, yes, I am Romanian. Ah, I'm fucking smart. I can tell that. Um, yeah, did you listen to Sam Harris' podcast with Andrew Sullivan? He says he finds Hitler Osama more personally respectable. I, I, I did hear that. And I was like, what? He... Sam Harris and I love I like listening to him and I do respect him a lot but he is off he has classic Trump derangement syndrome there's something about the way Trump speaks his braggadocio his off the cuffness his um that just it, it's funny cuz he even talks about how it's better like when 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 Trump bullshits and he says something that's obviously false I have the biggest crowd ever that bothers Sam more than when a president makes a calculated and cynical lie. Like when, when Obama says, if you like your health care, you can keep it, which he even used that as an example of a, a, a lie that Obama said, but he said it in a way that was manipulative. And the fact that it showed his ability to manipulate you indicated his intelligence and therefore his fitness for office. And that when Trump just says whatever comes into his mind, that just proves that he's not fit for office because he's not a good liar. I just, yeah, there's stuff like that. And the other big thing with Harris is that he just does not see the sins of the, the crimes of the state as anything. Like when he he interviewed Sanjaya Mukherjee, which he's interviewed him twice, and both times, Sam said very disturbing things that you could clear see that even Mukherjee, who I do do not think is a is a libertarian at all, was clearly against that. He interviewed him back like two two years ago, and they talked about eugenics. And Sam started talking about aborting, you know, babies that might have Down syndrome or other diseases because, quote, the state has an interest in, you know, cutting healthcare costs or whatever. And Mukherjee was like, I, the the Rubicon that you're crossing there, where the state can end a life because it's quote not in its interest, is one that you should not cross so lightly. But then more recently, when they were talking about COVID. And how the CDC uh, stopped all testing for six weeks at the stop. Like, they, like they, we, they got the first case, we had tests, and then the CDC says, well, we're going to create our own tests. And until we have certified a test, no more testing is allowed. And we declare, we declare a pandemic, so there's a monopoly. You can't legally do another test until we get it for six weeks. And Mukherjee's like, this is the single worst thing that could have happened. This is the most important time. And you had people who were begging to do tests. And you know what Harris said? He goes, yeah, that's a problem. That regulation is horrible. He goes, well, that's a feature, not a bug. That's a feature, not a bug. And so the CDC could lead to hundreds of, I made a video about this. You know, that decision could have led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Americans. And Sam Harris will even acknowledge that and just shrug it off because he believes in a state that does that, and that's just the price you have to pay, because, Lord forbid, they allow you to give a bad test. Oh, no, some people, you might have thalidomide babies then. Yes, if we had 10 thalidomide babies versus 100,000 people die of COVID, I think that's a fair fucking trade to make. Uh... I see the book, The Law by Frederick Bashi, that's 89 pager on prerequisite to revolution. Do you think Rand Paul? No idea. Boop, boop, boop. No, Trotsky said Hitler was better than Trump. What the fuck is wrong with these? That, that's just so crazy.
Yeah, I mean, there are people, there are people who are saying that, um, that the tech companies in the United States are getting more mouths than they ever had in China. Speaking of Romanians, oh yeah, that's right, you're Bulgarian. Do you guys hate each other or love each other? I mean, you guys are right next door. Speaking of Romanians, what do you think of Michael Malice's idea that it, the killing of Romanian commies is what caused North Korea to be so brutal? Uh, I don't think it caused them to be I, So I've heard him talk about this. I, apparently, uh, Kim, Kim Jong-il, or Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il took video of Ceausescu getting uh, gunned down and showed it to all the top brass or whatever in North Korea and said, we can't have openness. What did Kim Jong-il say? If you want openness, open a window. Um... <laughs> because this is what happens, right? We give a little bit of glasnost, a little bit of perestroika, and the next thing you know, you know, we're out of power. And we deserve to die, so we can't go out of power because then we'll be killed. Um, so, but I don't, I would, I would hesitate to say that's what caused it. They were a brutal communist dictatorship before. This might just be a, uh, a help to keep motivate them to, to stay in power. You guys are way too divided and leave issues un unresolved just due to being partisan issues. We didn't have so much emotion here between parts of society. The very real communist era of political. So wonder when, yeah, we all we all unified by a dictatorship. Great. Right? Look at these, all these Balkan people. Oh, wait, we have this debate. Broke Microphone does not consider himself being from the Baltic. I think Romania and, and Bulgaria are both in the Baltic. They're not, sorry, not the Baltic. The Balkans, excuse me. Oh, sorry, they're not in the Baltic. They're in the Balkans, yes. If you live anywhere, if you, if you, if you go from, uh, let's say, the, um, the Nista River, or the Sea of Azov, and you draw a line from that to the northern part of the Adriatic, you know, so say Venice, you draw a line from, um, say, let's say uh, Ljubljana in, in Slovenia to the mouth of the Nista River uh, uh, and the Black Sea, everything south of that is the Balkans. I'm just, I'm just going to call it that. Um, Is there another way to donate? I'm afraid if you can't do it through Streamlabs, I don't know how. So that's fine. I don't. I don't. I'm like. I mean, I'm not making money. I've, I've probably made a grand total of like mm, fifteen or twenty bucks total. I'm pretty sure my YouTube is not, um, not not monetized anymore. Like, I, and I never got any any pay for that. Fair delimitation of the Baltic Peninsula. Yeah, it's a peninsula, so you gotta, you gotta. And obviously, yeah, that's how I defined it, connecting the two seas. Um, it's a peninsula with many, many sub peninsulas on it. So culturally distinct, and there's all these different things. So, all right, guys. Uh, anyway, those are my thoughts on on the book. It is a good book. It's an important book if you want to know about the history of chattel slavery in the United States. And its role, or lack their role, or lack thereof, in, its, in, in capitalism and wealth in the United States, um, the evidence is pretty strong that it's not responsible for the prosperity of the United States. If it did anything, it probably held it back, or at least didn't help. Um, and obviously, um, its abolition didn't hold the United States back at all. The war of Spanish succession and its consequences have been a disaster. War is always a disaster. Selgando. All right, guys. Well, it's been a pleasure to be back and look for more videos in the future and have 